Good morning and welcome to Cool Spring. It is a joy to be able to greet you this morning. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. A couple of very special announcements very quickly this morning. Um, as a church, we have strived to reach out to be a part of a community uh, encouragement to our online teachers who have been teaching this year virtually. And so as you remember from last week, perhaps, that today we said was gift card Sunday. You may have brought a gift card to be able to share as part of uh, those gift bags that are going to the online teachers. And if you brought one this morning and you're wondering where do I turn that in and who do I give it to, it's not me. <laughs> but in the foyer and right here by this door you see a little brown basket on a pole where you put your offerings. You can put them in the same basket and we'll be sure they get to the right place and thank you in advance for sharing and giving in that way. Also, coming this summer is our Summer Music Activities Camp for Children, kindergartners through the fifth grade. And if you have grandchildren or neighbors you would like to invite to be a part of that, we would welcome their participation uh, this summer. And you simply go to coolspring.org slash SMAC, S-M-A-K. And it will take you right to our registration form, and we would love to uh, be able to welcome your children to our Summer Music Camp, uh, which is the third week in July. And uh, the dates are on there as well. Not the third week, but the last week in July. Uh, and then at the end of the week, the children will perform a musical called Back to the Beginning, which will, be, which will take place in, uh, here on the campus on August 1st. It's that first Sunday in August at 6 p.m. in the evening, and we welcome you. We'll remind you again later on if you'd like to come and just to attend uh, the event. We'd love to have you come and encourage the children. Uh, but we want to make sure that you're aware of that important ministry to our children for the summer. But we are blessed that you are here this evening, this morning, to join us in worship. I don't know if it's day or night. I don't know if I'm coming or going. It's been, uh, it's been one of those weeks. And uh, it's just a blessing to be in the Lord's house this morning, be able to worship and to serve. Psalm 100 verse 2 says that we're to worship the Lord with gladness. And we are to come before him with joyful songs. And the hymn says, I will serve the Lord with gladness in all my works and all my ways. And as I trust in the Lord, he will guide my steps. And so may I, may I be faithful in how God has called me to serve. And so we would ask that you would stand with a joyful heart this morning. Let's just lift our voices in joyful praise this morning. Please. 
you'll give us just a quick second, we're going to make a short transition here. blessing of the silence. You know, okay, sometimes, just for life to be peaceful and still. Um, I think of the first time that I actually stepped on the shore of a sandy beach and saw the ocean and the tides and the waves roll in for the first time to see the beauty and the majesty of who God is. And even in silence, to be able to stand and let your eyes behold the majesty of the mountains with their snow-covered peaks. You're just kind of in awe of who God is, that you can't help proclaim how great thou art.
So the beauty of God's word, Psalm 56, and the psalmist writes, Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanderers pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I will not be afraid. and every day 
even though at times it can be difficult. But you say, I'm going to start today by trusting Him, by trusting in the Lord and in each promise He gives us in His Word. There is a, a song that I'm pretty sure most all of you today have heard before. Um, this song is covered in millions of people, millions, millions of Christians across the world. Uh, it was penned in 1904 by Sevilla Martin. She was born in 1866 in Nova Scotia, Canada. She was married to an evangelist, and together they traveled all over the United States conducting evangelistic campaigns, and she worked very hard with her husband together to provide music for these meetings. This song was inspired by a visit that Sevilla made to an ill and, be, and a bedridden friend. Her friend was discouraged by illness, but remembered that a God who watches over each and every little sparrow, that she would therefore, she believed that the same God would watch over her. It is from this incident that Mrs. Martin thought of writing a poem about this incident, and so she completed it the very same day. Later on, she sent the poem to Charles Gabriel, a well-known composer of hymns in those days, and Charles added music to the song that has soothed and comforted millions all over the world. The song is called His Eye is on the Sparrow. The sparrow is one of the smallest birds in the world and may be considered as of no consequence to many people and can be sold very cheaply. But Jesus says God does, still does care and notices when just one of them falls to the ground. Matthew 10 verses 29 to 31 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. If God cares about the tiny sparrow, how much more will he care for, for your needs, my brothers and sisters? And that is the message and the meaning of this phrase, his eye is on the sparrow. So why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? For Jesus, you see, he is my portion. It's a blessing for us today to be able to listen in the stillness of the moment and just to reflect and to allow God's spirit just to settle over your heart this morning as you prepare to receive the spoken word today. We are blessed by the talents of this young lady who sits at the piano this morning. Tomorrow will be 40 years of Christian service here at Cool Spring, where she has served as pianist and organist and accompanist for the choir all these years, played in the praise band, and she continues to serve so faithfully. And we are so blessed as a church to have her gifts and talents here to minister to you each and every Sunday. And so this morning, I've asked her to play this song, His Eyes on the Sparrow, that we might reflect as Jill leads us in worship this morning through the keys. May God bless your heart and speak to your very need this day.
I think we'll just close in prayer. <laughs> I'm listening to him. I'm listening to him for sure. Um, and I was sharing this more earlier in the first service um, that about Jill being here for 40 years in this role as instrumentalist and her creativity and her passion and her love for Full Spring. I said, it's amazing that she was eight years old when she started. And, uh, <laughs> done so well uh, over these years and, and learned well. So I uh, appreciate that. And, um, and Glenn and Wendy, thank you uh, for sharing this morning as well. Very powerful uh, rendition of certainly an old favorite um, of, of everyone here this morning um, as well. Would you uh, just join me in, in a word of prayer? And, and Father, we recognize your presence in this place today. We recognize um, that you are the great shepherd. We are your sheep. And Lord, it's, it's our desire that we would follow you as you lead, wherever you lead. And so would you make that evident in our life for us? Father, would you capture our attention to listen and to go? Lord, I, uh, I pray for the conversation today and its application in life. I think for the stories of your word that, that speak volumes in not only the establishment and understanding of, of doctrine and theology that is something we hold on to, but, but about practice in our life. So may the day be a challenge and an encouragement as we study together. We love you, Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So I'm really looking forward to these next several weeks um, to share with you kind of this series of my favorite stories. And it's somewhat personal, but my hope is as we learn together these next weeks that you too will identify those stories, those narratives in Scripture that God continues to bring to mind to remind you of His presence and of His leading, of His mission, of your following. And the stories that I'll share over the next several weeks, including today, are stories that God has used to inform my theology, but also to shape my practice. So this really is a, a series, a talk series, about what we call orthodoxy and orthopraxy. It is about right belief, it is about right action. And so today, I, I want to share with you out of Matthew chapter 14. And if you have your Bibles, open them up. If you have your electronic, go ahead and tab over there, and uh, it'll be on the screen for you as well. But I want to read to you this story, and for some it will be familiar. Maybe it will be the first time that you've heard it. But verse 22 of chapter 14, what has happened in the verses previous is you've discovered this and experienced and watched Jesus feeding 5,000 people. You have, you have seen a miracle take place before your eyes. His disciples have witnessed this. They've experienced it firsthand. After it's over, Jesus immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was long way from the land beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, about 3 a.m. in the morning, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear, 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying, Oh, you a little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. There are four moments in this story that develop four principles that speak into a doctrine, into a theology of risk. The first one that I want you to see and to understand is where, where Jesus puts the disciples in the boat and sends them on their way. It's how the story starts. Jesus tells them to leave. Get in the boat. Go to the other side. I'll be there. You just go. And so that's what they do. But you have to kind of time the hours that they're in the boat trying to make it to the other side. But there's a problem. The story tells us that their boat is being beaten by the waves. And that they're moving into the headwind. They're moving forward into the wind. So it's taking them longer to get across than normal. But this is the first principle that comes out of the story that speaks to us. And it's a story, it's a principle that, that I resonate with in so many different ways. And here it is. Following Jesus isn't always easy. It's tough. In fact, it can be exhausting. Think about the boat, think about the headwind, think about trying to get across, think about the waves crashing against the side, think about the impediments to moving forward. But they're right where Jesus told them to be. Jesus said, get in the boat and go on the other side. And yet they they are met with this headwind and rough waves. It, it's difficult. Listen, following Jesus isn't always easy. It's hard sometimes. And for some reason, we, we love to placate theology in a sense. And we talk about, well, listen, if you're just in the will of God, everything's going to be working out and it's all going to be fine. Or if you love Jesus, life will be easy. If you just do the right thing, then, then you'll be happy. Do you realize that's bad theology? Scripture says if we're going to follow him, we're going to have difficult days. That's just the truth. But here's the key. 
It doesn't matter how difficult it is, as long as you are where God sent you, told you to go, where you're supposed to be. As long as you're where you're supposed to be, He will meet you there. It doesn't matter the distraction, it doesn't matter the headwind, it doesn't matter the waves that beat on the side of the boat. Now I'm sure some of you today said, well, I really wish you would just said that, that God just makes life so much easier and if I just love Jesus, life would be perfect and sweet and kind and a bed of roses. I can lie to you and then you can go out and realize it's not true. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's exhausting. You just need to be right where God has called you to be. But then as you continue to, to move through the story, there's another principle that comes out, and it's, it's where the disciples were. I, in my mind, they're exhausted. They've been trying to get across the, the lake for a while now. They've been out there for hours. They're not really making a lot of headway, though they've made far off from the shore. But they still have a long way to go. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. And they see Jesus, but they think it's a ghost. In their exhaustion, in their lack of forward motion, they think they see Jesus, but they're not sure and they're afraid and they cry out. I can imagine chaos in that moment. They're all wondering what's going on. It's chaotic. They're, they're trying to get across and, and they're exhausted and they're tired. And, and yet, in this crying out, they hear the voice of Jesus. Take heart, it's I. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Here's the principle that comes to play. That we need to listen for his voice. What I call in and through and above the chaos. We need to set our ears to hear his voice even amidst the chaos. Even amidst the yelling and the screaming and the crying out, they could hear Jesus speak in his eye. Don't fear. We need to position ourselves to be in a place where we can hear him speak. How does he speak? He speaks through his word. He speaks through other Jesus followers. He speaks through moments of reflection and contemplation. He speaks through, through times in which believers gather. It's about listening. Listening for his voice. But then there's another principle. And it's where they recognize it's Jesus, things settle down a bit, and, and Peter says, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out to you. And Jesus says, come. I love that part of the story where, where Jesus gets out of the boat and he walks towards Jesus. <laughs> Think about this. You have a guy who's in the boat, headwind, the waves hitting against the boat. His call is to leave that safety of the boat and so he, he gets to the side of the boat and he begins to step out. And you know, it's not the first step that's so important here. With one step, he tests the water. It's the second step that made all the difference. Because he had to let go of the boat and begin to walk Lord Jesus. 
Peter walked on the water. Here's the third principle at play. Jesus, Jesus invites me to risk. And at the root of risk is trust. Because what Jesus is asking Peter to do is to leave the comfort of that tossing and turning boat that's getting blown around and to walk out onto the water with him. Do you realize how much is at risk? Do we realize how much trust it takes? Would you have gotten out of the boat? Would you have let loose of the rail? Yet Peter risks. I don't have a time, time to develop this theology of risk for you. But somewhere between the providence of God and the humanity of man is this equation of risk. There's a tension there. Risk is about trust. How much do you trust God to get out of the boat and to step on the water? and to follow him. Now I want you to know, this story, God uses it over and over and over again in my life. To remember faith isn't easy. Brad, you have to listen to me. You have to be willing to get out of the boat. But here's, here may be the most important part of the risk. Because Peter gets out of the boat and Peter walks on the water and gets very close to, close enough to Jesus that Jesus just has to reach out to him. But you know what it says in the story? It says he saw the wind. How many of you all see wind? You don't see, you see the effect of it. You see it blowing across the white caps of the water, which they'll get white caps on the sea, on the lake. Maybe he sees it in the sail. Maybe he sees it in the hair of, of the guys that are with him on the boat. But all that tells me is that he quit looking at Jesus. And he started taking attention and note of the distractions and the discouragements. This will always, this will always happen. When you step out of the boat and take the risk, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. Because it is a trust factor as you follow him because... There will always be distractions. There will always be discouragements. There will always be things that will try to eclipse your view of Jesus. You cannot take your look, your eyes off of him. You have to keep Jesus in view. Now, I would say... There's some people in the room today that Jesus has been calling you to take the risk, to join the adventure, to step out from where it is safe or where you perceive safety to be because it's what you know, and to trust him enough to follow him.
Gary Hogan in his book, Just Courage, tells a story at being 10 years old. It's a great story. He grew up outside of Seattle. They went to Mount Rainer, and uh, oftentimes his dad and his two older brothers, and they would do hikes out there in the parks. He was always mesmerized at the natural growth and, and the trees and the size of the trees. And, but on this particular day, he was getting tired. They had reached Paradise, which is where the, the Welcome Center is and where uh, they've got lots of exhibits of, of things about the mountain and the volcano and all the stuff that's there, the history. And his dad wanted to take the boys to Camp Muir, which is kind of a base camp for people where they're going to take the next level. But it's a trip, it's a hike. Two older brothers were excited about it. Gary was looking at the, the, the legal clause that was posted by the entryway on the path to the camp. In his mind, all it said was, if you go this way, you will die. <laughs> that you may fall off the cliff, that you may require medical assistance. Don't do this. So he's torn. His dad says, come on, we'll have a great time. We'll go up there. And your brothers and I, I'll be with you. I'll take care of you. Just come on. He's like, dad, I don't want to do that. I'm fine. I'm just going to stay right here in paradise. And I'm going to hang out in this space. They've got great exhibits. Things I can learn. Y'all just go on and walk up there. And believe it or not, Dad left him in paradise. All the two older brothers, Dad, went up to Camp Yard. They were gone all afternoon. Gary said he watched, looked at every exhibit, he watched every clip. He said, funny thing was, every clip was about the people that had, count, had climbed Mount Rainier. He said it was about what he was missing. He said at the end of the day, his dad and his brothers came back and he said they were just flushed with stories of excitement of the beauty of the walk. He said, now they had some scrapes and some scratches on them, but... They had a great time. In fact, they were talking about this was the best day of the entire trip. Gary said it taught me something about risk. He said, He said, that day I was. I was present for the trip. But I missed the adventure. I was present for the trip. But I missed the adventure. Some of you are present for your faith. But you're missing the adventure. Now I'm going to say something and I don't want any of you going out of here making any sort of undertones of political beliefs or my position on things. <laughs> Some of you think you have me figured out, but ha ha, I'll surprise you one day, right? <clears throat> I think the last 16 months, the last 16 months of COVID, the message of being safe, the message of isolation, the message of distancing, the message of don't gather, the message of stay here, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't go here. And while COVID is real, and I know people that are sick and have been sick, I know people have died from it. It's real.
But I think the message of COVID has taken away the spirit of adventure and risk from the church. Amen. Now some of you are trying to determine my politics, right? But no. <laughs> this is spiritual. This, this is far beyond politics. The church has forgotten what it's like to get out of the boat and follow Jesus. The church has forgotten to risk the sense of adventure. We can't do that. We have to regain the risk. We have to regain the adventure. We have to get out of the boat. Then we need to follow Jesus. This story is just bubbling over in me and welling up on the inside. God has continued to use this story in seasons of my life to remind me that he is in control. And that I just need to get out of the boat and just follow him. But keep my eyes on him. So I want to challenge you today. Don't just sign up for the trip. Take the adventure. Don't miss out on what God has or God wants to do. Because you read the end of the story, what happened? God got in the boat. Jesus got in the boat. And the winds died down. Surely, surely, this is the Son of God. Do you realize because Peter was willing to risk, Jesus was glorified? It could be that the risk that God is calling you to, the adventure that he's calling you to, isn't just about you. It's about giving glory to Jesus. The people will see him. Take the risk. Will you pray with me? Father, Thank you for stories that speak to life and to where we are and to the experiences that shape us. Lord, I recognize that as Christ followers today, we need to regain a sense of adventure, a sense of risk. And so would you help us to know what that looks like in our own life, in our families, in our church? For your glory, not for ours, but in such a way that draws people to Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for the adventure that is ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and, and sing a hymn of affirmation today and maybe contemplate maybe contemplate what it looks like for you to step onto the water what is he calling you to do today let's stand let's sing
Jill, happy anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> 40 years of silence. That is actually we have one party, so let's go right to that. Um, also, uh, this does not necessarily affect your transition in this room as much, but on May 9th, 16th, and 23rd, we're actually running all of our services out of this room for those three weeks because we're redoing the floors of the gym. Uh, believe it or not, I've uh, been there for about 19 years now. Uh, this is the first time the floors will have been done to this level, uh, so it requires a three-week work period for them to refurbish the floors in the gym. So we'll be in this room uh, for all of our services. So we'll be transitioning fairly quickly uh, over those uh, the 9th, 16th, and 23rd. So just so you're aware that you may see people or hear something in this room as you're trying to pull up and come in, we'll have people stationed in other places. Also today, uh, beginning at 1.30, um, we have several baptisms this afternoon, so we're doing some baptismal services from about 1.30 to 2.30. Um, so excited about that as well, and uh, looking forward to that. So you can pray for us this afternoon as we celebrate that. You'll be able to see those, um, I think, on the 16th of May. Is that when we're going to show them? Something like that. Uh, next few weeks as we're recording all this, we can uh, share with everybody as well. Well, I know every one of you will put on your spirit of adventure when you leave. Amen? Amen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. On that, I just got to pray and go. So, uh, <laughs> Father, uh, again, thank you for the time to gather today, and thank you for your word and the encouragement that it gives. And Father, for us as Christ followers, I recognize we have been bombarded with uh, messages um, over these past months, and, and it's, it's, it's the reality. I, I recognize the word that it's, it's a reality of where we live, but sometimes those messages can have unintended consequences. And for Christ followers, it may be that we've, we've lost the spirit of adventure, we've lost the spirit of risk. And so would you help us to regain that as we live out faith with you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great day. Amen.